fighting of a war has by definition never been easy. When you think about history, you can recall no doubt times when men, people just like us, they fought long, hard battles, wars, to overcome, well, barbaric foes, lying propaganda, intimidation, dirty tactics. They've overcome all those things because they've seen something they wanted and they fought for it. Well, as Christians, we may feel, well, Christian neutrality, we don't get involved in wars. Nothing could be further from the truth. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 is a declaration of war. And all intelligent life are involved. And please note, if we want to please Jehovah God, we have to see ourselves as a front line troop. Oh, it's not a fleshly war. Success is not dependent on one side or the other having more nuclear submarines or strike planes or whatever, but it is a war. And to be honest, it's not a gentlemanly conflict. It's not a war fought under the uh, regime of the Geneva Convention. No, it's a dirty war. Because we fight against fiendish spirit creatures, Satan and his demonic hordes, who've just got one desire. They want to show no mercy, no compassion, so they can cause as much mayhem, suffering and death as is possible. And they've had a lot of experience at it. It's also a hard war. Because we also fight against the world, that world out there, that's totally alienated from Jehovah God. Have you read about it recently? It's a dirty, smutty, perverted, corrupt, disgusting cesspit of a world. And they want us to become stained like them. It's hard, isn't it? Add to these the fact that it's also a difficult war because we also fight 24 hours per day against our own imperfect fleshly leanings. It's true. You put these three things together, it's a dirty war we fight against Satan and his demonic hordes. It's a hard war because we fight against that world alienated from God. And it's a difficult war because of the 24 hour per day struggle we put these things together and we suddenly realize why it's so vitally important that we take to heart what Jehovah inspired the Bible writer Jude to write down for us. Let's open our Bibles and just remind ourselves of this. Jude verse 3 we're going to read. Now look at what he actually says. It's very interesting. Jude verse 3. And we can see that he had to change tack. He had a desire to do something, but other things came to light, so he changed. Notice verse 3, he said, Beloved ones, though I was making every effort to write to you about the salvation we hold in common, I found it necessary to write to you, to exhort you to put up a hard fight for the faith that was once for all time delivered to the Holy Ones. Did you see what kind of fight? He didn't say, listen, let's be honest and realistic about it. If you put in a little bit of effort every now and then, you'll get through. Don't worry about it. He said, put up a hard fight for the faith. Do you feel as if you're putting up a hard fight for the faith? No doubt we do. That's very good. Because that's what it is. It's a struggle. It's a fight. But did you notice what he said we should be fighting for? We can get so confused about this. He did not say, but a hard fight for faith. Look at it very carefully. He doesn't say that. He says, put up a hard fight for... Did you see the definite article? Brother Robertson mentioned it. No indefinite article in Greek. There's no A. Only the definite, the. He says, the faith. Do we know what the faith is? How can you fight for something if you don't know what you're fighting for? 
what will happen is you go into a battle scene and that's where we are and instead of being charging forward and courageous and bold and fighting hard you think I don't know I don't know what's going on here what am I fighting for no idea oh let's amble around take the easy route out in the end I'll retreat that's what takes place for us to know or for us to fight rather we've got to know what the faith is would you like to know this is going to be one of the most important things we'll ever hear because if we fight for what's coming next we'll live the faith is the sum total of the writings inspired by Jehovah God to be included in his word the Bible that is the faith all the teachings of Jesus Christ not all the teachings that Jesus gave but all the ones that Jehovah said that one's in the Bible they go in the Bible he inspired them not to write down their own thoughts but he inspired them to write down the thoughts that really sum up to the faith are we fighting for it you see you speak to many brothers and they they think of faith and they think oh Hebrews 11 verse 1 well all Paul was doing there was giving a definition of the word faith Do remember he actually used those two Greek terms they're very interesting one of the Greek terms means a title deed and the other one means supportive or clarifying evidence now let's think about that in our terms if someone knocked on your door and said I am a solicitor representing the estate of John Paul Getty and I have something for you and he handed over something and you looked at it and on the top he said title deed would you read it or would you think oh another piece of junk mail <laughs> dear me <laughs> get these all the time through the post you'd read it wouldn't you I would and I'd study it and I check that the language was correct. I check that it made sense. And I go over it and over it and over it. You know, every time I read it, because you know how things are written in legalistic language, I think, oh, I didn't notice that. Look at that. I've inherited 50,000 acres of Australia and the mineral deeds. <sighs> Would you be excited if someone gave you that on the doorstep? I'll say. And what if they also gave you clarifying, supportive evidence? Perhaps aerial photographs. How about how about other documents that support the title deed? How about maps? How about telephone numbers? How about if you had clarifying evidence? Oh, the the man who who works and the manages the um, lots of gold and precious things mine in Australia that you've just inherited. He's got his phone number. Do you know what I do? I'd ring him up. Would you do that? I'll say. What if it costs too much? I'd get the money from somewhere. I'd ring him up. And if I spoke to him on the phone and said, um, Oh, is that Mr. Um, is that Mr. Dave Thomas? Yes. Are you the manager of the um, Lots of Precious Things Gold Mine in Australia? Yes. Who are you? I'm Bill Harris. Oh, you're the man I work for. I tell you what, you want to come over here. Lots of gold here. When are you going to come over, Mr. Harris? I'd be over there in about 30 seconds, would you? <laughs> Yeah. would you take it that seriously yeah. I would do you know do you know where the title deed and the clarifying evidence is it's in that book have we studied it do we know what we're fighting for are we excited by it do we pour over it until we've got every last detail out of it and then go over it again do we check up the supportive clarifying evidences do we do it we can't fight for the faith unless we do. Because unless we do that, we don't know what the faith is. Do you see the point? Dig deep into God's word, the Bible, and we'll find plenty of things worth fighting for. Because let's be quite honest, the faith is our future. Without the faith, we've got nothing. We're more to be pitied than the people outside. At least, it seems, they're making good use of that world out there now. We are controlling ourselves to avoid certain things. But what's the point if we haven't got something to work towards? Find out what the faith is all about. It's important. Of course, once we find it, we may feel, well, that's all there is to it. 
But of course we've got to fight for it, but we're fighting for it by being here today. Our youngsters in school, when they're picked on, they're fighting for the faith. Our older brothers and sisters, when they know full well it would be far easier to stay indoors in the cosy warm, perhaps those who have had medical treatment, and those who think to themselves well, it would be so much easier to stay at home than go to the meetings, but they fight for the faith and they get here and I can see them here today. They're fighting for the faith. Our spiritual family heads, who they come home from work and they're exhausted. Because you know what the employers are doing today? They're squeezing the lemon to the pipsqueak. They're going to get every last drop out of their employees. But you know, our brothers, they still come home and have their Bible study with their family because they're going to fight for the faith because it's worth it. That's what fighting for the faith is all about. But even though we're fighting for it, there could still be a problem. And we understand that that is the case because of what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, this would not be necessary if, once we've got the faith, all that was included was fighting for it. Nope, there's something else involved. Let's take a look. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And notice what Paul wrote in verses, or in verse 5. Now, he says, Keep testing whether you are in the faith. Keep proving what you yourselves are. Or do you not recognize that Jesus Christ is in union with you, unless you disapproved? Did you see, once we've got the faith, did you see what we had to do with it? He said we've got to keep testing, keep proving. Why? It's because the Bible makes perfect sense. Did you notice recently we had our convention in the McDermott Park? Did you notice the stadium that we sat in? What a, a beautiful structure, wasn't it? Did you have a good look? I know in some of the talks we all have a look around the stadium, don't we, some of the talks? Well, we shouldn't, but we do. Maybe in the dinner break. We'll say we do it then. And you look at, at the concrete pillars in those structures. Do you know, they're huge, huge. And yet, even though that building is only a few years old, they spend thousands of pounds having surveyors come in and look in at that stadium, check in. They look at those concrete pillars. We were in the Arms Park once and they had all these ultrasonic pieces of equipment and they were looking right down deep inside these huge concrete pillars for any tiny little flaws. Do you know why? Because concrete pillars are just like our faith. On the outside it can look rock solid. But deep down inside there could be a little flaw that if left unchecked is going to grow. And it's going to keep growing until in the end, even though the structure looks rock solid on the outside, because of that unchecked flaw, the whole thing, when the pressure comes, could come crashing down. But we were watching um, Discovery Television recently. I don't like saying this. People think I'm on a percentage. But Discovery te Television has all sorts of little programs, isn't it? And we were watching one about a disaster in the United States in the 1950s. A bridge came down. All the people who were driving over it died. And do you know what it all came down to? Did you see the program? <sighs> Suspension bridge. There it was. Two... two um, pillars either side and a cable that came down, lots of little cables that attached the bridge platform to it. <coughs> One morning it came crashing down. Some of the eyewitnesses said they heard an explosion, so they were looking for terrorist activity. Didn't find anything. All they found was half of a bolt. The bolt wasn't that size, it was only about that size. This was one of the bolts that, there's the bridge, there's the pillar, there's the cable. The ones that go up to that big cable, it was one of the bolts that attached there down to the bridge. And they only found one half of it. And the man said, this is what brought the bridge down. Tiny little bolt. They looked into it, there was a mi you couldn't see it when he showed it to you, it didn't make any sense to me, but there was a microscopic flaw in the metal. And when the pressure came on, it snapped. That was the explosive noise. And because the bolt went, the cable came down. And because that cable came down, the rest of it all failed. All came down to one bolt. How about us with our faith? Have we got problems somewhere? Would you like to find out? 
what we've got to do is survey our faith in the same way as they survey those huge concrete buildings and we can do it right now. Have we got a notepad and pen? We're going to give out a few little questions that in effect are like a survey of our faith. Now, this survey, remember, is pretty useless unless we do it. And I know sometimes we can think, well, no one else will know. In fact, it's a good idea not to do this survey with someone else, but to sit down quietly and prayerfully and honestly analyse ourselves in the light of these questions. If we do, we'll benefit. Take a look at these questions. Write these down. Now, the first question for prayerful and honest review is this. It just says, Is my faith growing stronger or weaker? Is my faith growing stronger or weaker? Try analysing what we're doing today with what we were doing six months ago. 12 months ago, 18 months ago. Yes, we know that circumstances change, but if they haven't, and yet we're doing a lot less, can you see what the graph says? There's a problem. Second question. Am I taking good care of all, and that's the operative word, all, my spiritual needs? Do I prepare for the meetings? Have I got this simple progressive ministry that this Welshman keeps going on about? Do I read the Bible daily? We don't seem to be read all of the Bible daily. Just try a chapter. Just try one chapter a night and five or ten minutes thinking about it. Am I taking good care of all my spiritual... If not, we've got a problem. Do you see that? There's going to be a problem. And the last question, to me, this one gets right down to the nitty-gritty in our country. The question's very simple. What is more important to me? What is more important to me? Material things? Would you like to be rich? How about this for a revelation? I know fools who can make a fortune in that world. If you want to make a fortune, that world can provide it. You don't have to be intelligent. You can be a fool. Just go out and do it. But what's more important? Spir uh, material things? How about a name with the world? How about you young brothers and sisters? Do you want to be a sportsman? Well, that's for the brothers. What do you think, James? Would you like to be the greatest footballer on the earth? You would. <laughs> try, try changing the answer, James. Try changing. <laughs> but you see this. What's more important, we'll, we'll move away from that. What's more important, is it material things, a name with the world? Or how about this? Do I recognize that real happiness only comes from worshipping Jehovah whole soul? Because I can assure you, that's it. That is it. Do you remember a man called Jeff Astle? Oh, well, perhaps Craig could just, brother, uh, brother, Craig, I've forgotten Craig's second name now. Brother Platt, there, yeah, perhaps Brother Platt could speak to James about Jeff Astle, and he'll understand why being the greatest footballer on the earth is no big deal. Have a chat afterwards about that. So there are the questions for the survey. But I tell you what, it's a foolish engineer who's got a structure and he doesn't survey it. So let's do it. And when we find the flaws, and we most definitely will, don't give in to the lying propaganda that says, if there are any flaws, you're useless, you might as well give up. We're not. The apostles said in Luke 17, verse 5, they said to Jesus Christ, give us more faith. They had problems. Did Jesus Christ let them down? They were eyewitnesses of things that if they thought about would have given them the faith. And they evidently did. Now with us, we're not going to be eyewitnesses of the same type of thing that the apostles were. But Jehovah God will answer our requests for more faith. And he does it via his word, the Bible. If we heed the warnings, for instance, in the book of Jude, it's going to benefit our faith.
Let's go to it once more and find out what these warnings are. Now Jude is only a very short book, so we know the warnings are going to be rather direct. That makes sense, doesn't it? And what are they? Verse 5. Jude states, I desire to remind you, despite your knowing all things once for all time, that Jehovah, although he saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those not showing faith. In what way didn't they show faith? In the same way as the ones in verse 6 didn't show it. And the angels that did not keep their original position but forsook their own proper dwelling place, he is reserved with eternal bonds and a dense darkness for the judgment of the great day. What was the angel's problem? The same one as those mentioned in verse 7 had. So too, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, after they, in the same manner as the foregoing ones, had committed fornication excessively and gone out after flesh for unnatural use, are placed before us as a warning example. What was their problem? Immorality. Satan's favorite ploy. Now, are we willing to heed the warning about immorality. You see, we could be at this moment saying to ourselves, I would never commit immorality. Well, that's excellent. It's good to have that rock-solid resolve. But, deep down inside, is there a flaw that's developing? For instance, although we say we never commit immorality, do we find television programs with it on entertaining? What if it treats immorality as a joke? Do we find it funny? How about some of these soap operas who 20 years ago they would never have had people living together in sin but now if they're not living together in sin well it's not a popular soap opera. Do you get that? It's true isn't it? The sun is straight down. Do we find it entertaining? Is, it, is our Bible trained conscience saying, I shouldn't be watching this? If not, well, why is it not telling us we shouldn't be watching it? I'll tell you why. It's because we find it acceptable. We are being entertained by it. We are starting to weaken. I could never go as far as committing immorality though, brother. Don't ever make a statement like that. Remember the angels? They'd had association with Jehovah God. But they looked. They weakened. They were entertained. Those mighty spirit creatures sinned and lost out. If you want to fight hard for your faith, fight hard against all that could eventually lead to immorality. Do you see what we're talking about? And we also have to say that in our circuit we have the sad, sad fact that we've got a problem with ones going to places of entertainment that are totally inappropriate for Christians, nightclubs and all sorts of different things. Now I'm not going to get into that trap of saying, well what's a nightclub, what's a public house? That's not the point. You'll never see a list of places that we shouldn't go to on the notice board at the back of the Kingdom Hall. But you know, if you're fooling yourself, and sometimes we can do that, can't we? The rationalization of our heart, making what's unacceptable acceptable, we mentioned it on Thursday. If you're fooling yourself and thinking that you can go into that world and get entertainment in certain places, you're going to suffer. You see, there are places out there where there are those sexual predators who are highly skilled at homing in on the innocent and naive, and that's basically us, hopefully, and making us their prey. But the big problem, and this is so sad, is that we even have some who profess to be Jehovah's Witnesses saying things like, you come along with me. Come on, I've been going to these nightclubs for years, nothing's ever happened to me. You know that Bill Harris, he's never been to a nightclub, he hasn't. What does he know? Think. If you wanted to hunt ducks, isn't it true? 
you take a piece of wood and you carve it into the shape of a duck, you paint it, you spend some time on it, and then you push it out onto a lake to attract the other ducks. And when they all came down and landed around it, which is the one you'd never shoot? Do you get it? You never shoot your decoy duck. And when they say, I've been going to these places for years, nothing's ever happened to me. Decoy ducks. Keep away from them. What are they doing in the congregation? Are they wooden Christians? Do you see the point? If you want to fight hard for your faith, reject all forms of immorality, all that leads to immorality, and please note, all places that promote or even condone immorality. Get away from them. Heed the warning. Whose faith is going to benefit? Ours if we do it. Can you see what the warnings can do for us? How about another one? How about in verses 8 and 10? Now look at this. This is very interesting. It says, In like manner, so in the same way as the ones previously fell with regards to immorality, in like manner, notwithstanding, these men too, indulging in dreams, are defiling the flesh and disregarding lordship and speaking abusively of the glorious ones. Do you know any who speak abusively of the glorious ones? Jehovah's arrangement, his structure. Do you remember on Thursday night, they, they were moaning and groaning and murmuring against Moses, but who was it they were putting to the test? It was Jehovah. Do you remember that? And today, you're getting ones who are moaning and... Now, we're not saying that all complaining is wrong, because we had a lovely, balanced article recently that pointed out that actually some complaining is beneficial. Hmm. But if we're a griper and a moaner and a groaner against imperfect men, and they all are, we've got a problem, and it's a big problem. And you know what some of these ones are actually saying? Well, they fit in perfectly to verse 10. You see, it says there, yet these men, these moaners, groaners, ridiculers, etc., they are speaking abusively of all the things they really do not know. They're even saying things against the slave class, the governing body. You know, recently we've had clarification about certain points, haven't we? The generation, sheep and the goats. All those different things. And we've actually had some who have foolishly said, well, I don't understand it. As if if they don't understand it, it must be wrong. How stupid. If you'd been in a natural disaster, and you were in an underground railway station, and all the lights had gone down, the whole place was littered with debris, and you knew that you had to get out to live, and there was one person with a torch showing you the way, if that one person, because they had a torch, and they could see what was lying about, found another torch, picked it up, turned it on, it was brighter, would you complain? Do you get the point? The slave class are the ones with the torch. When they find a brighter, when it comes to their attention that they've been incorrect, aren't we glad that they humbly say we've been wrong in the past? This is the truth. Aren't we glad that we can see more clearly what's coming up in front of us? Us not seeing it doesn't change or doesn't move it from being there. But it helps us to take the necessary steps to cope with it when it comes. Do you see the point? Are we willing to go along with Jehovah God's way of revealing matters to his servants? If not, we're on a slippery slope. And do you know where it ends up? Verses 18 and 19. It says there, in the past, now he was quoting here from Peter. In the last time, there will be ridiculers, proceeding according to their own desires for ungodly things. These are the ones that make separations. Animalistic men, not having spirituality. Do you know any who are animalistic? Do you know what that word means? It simply means solical. That is, those who have a desire for the fleshly things rather than the spiritual things. And there's lots of them about. Do you know any? They spread their own doctrines. How about this for a doctrine? Take it easy. It's better to party than to preach. 
Jehovah knows we need recreation. He's balanced. And if taking recreation means, well, we've got to miss a few meetings, or cut down on the amount of time we spend in the field service, Jehovah understands. Solical men, animalistic, only out for their own fleshly gratification. Me first, God last, no spirituality. Keep away from them. Do you see the point? And where do these ones end up? Well, he said in the beginning of verse 19, they make separations. Now that little term is really speaking about apostates. They're on the march. Yesterday I had to go to an elders meeting. An elder just brought, came up to me and said, we've had this sent to us. It was all apostate things downloaded from the internet. So many things. And you know, these people are so cunning, these apostates. You never see them outside the assembly with a t-shirt, I am an apostate, written on it, do you? Oh no, they masquerade as nice people. How about those little chat rooms on the internet? We're interested in your opinions about the society's literature. Two-faced. Do you know, years ago, when we knocked on their doors, they had the same ploy, but they worded it slightly differently. Do you remember what they used to say? I love your magazines. These, these Watch Town Awake magazines, they're stunning. I really enjoy listening or reading them. I really do. I love it. I'll take some of yours. If you take some of mine. Please come back. Does it make any sense to take apostate literature? If you went out for a picnic with your family, and sometimes we do, don't we? And we're out there in a beautiful place, the gingham tablecloths on the floor, and we've got all the goodies our wives have made them. And if you were sitting down eating that lovely picnic meal, and all of a sudden you looked up and you saw way over in the distance a tramp, a man destitute, as Christians, you know what we'd all do? We'd say, we've got all this excessive food. I'll put some in a bag and I'll take it over to him. And we'd go over there with our, our goodies in a bag. And we'd say, my wife and our family were over there having a picnic, so we just brought along this goodies. We've got so much. You know what wives are like? Too much food. We brought this along for you. Would you like to have it? And he opens up the bag and he says, oh, I do enjoy those. Oh, those are, that's my favourite then. That's very kind. I tell you what. He puts his hand in his pocket, takes out from the pocket his own bag. He opens it up, and a swarm of flies come out. And you look inside, and there is a rancid, maggot-ridden, mouldy, old beef sandwich. And he says, I'll have one of yours, if you have one of mine. Would you take it? Would you take it? Never. It's got meat in it. It's got something, it's nutritious meat. There it is, would you take it? Don't have anything to do with apostasy. Don't think that we can handle it. Jehovah's protection is we don't touch it. If we go beyond his direction and we don't heed that warning, we're on our own. And I can assure you, we'll fail. Can we see how heeding the warnings given by the Bible writer Jude can benefit us? You see, all we've done, we just scanned through a few verses, and we've thought about them in our terms. And we've just taken a look at the things that Jude says, do not do. Of course, he also points us in the direction as to how we should expend our energies. Look at verses 20 and 21. But you, beloved ones, by building up yourselves on your most holy faith and praying with God's Holy Spirit keep yourself keep yourselves in God's love do we do it? 95 here for the meeting that is so good but if we want to build up our faith what we need to do is arrange our affairs so that these types of meetings are a priority that's fighting for the faith, isn't it? Oh, we may have to make a number of sacrifices, but Jehovah God has said he'll provide for us. Do we really have the faith that he'll do so? He'll never let us down if we put him first. Jesus Christ said it. Jehovah said it. It's true. Build up on the faith. Keep in touch with Jehovah God via prayer. Don't forget what we said on Thursday. Don't make our big prayer the last one. 
because we'll drop asleep. Get it when we're fully alert. Communicate with Jehovah God as if he was standing right next to us. He is a real person. And by doing so well, we keep ourselves in God's love, that blessed state whereby we know that what we do pleases him. The Bible's the faith. Study it. Remember, we are at this moment fighting a powerful and barbaric foe. But brothers, victory is in sight. So let's be determined to put up a hard fight for our 